video game. It was after a party in which I had to PJ and um, I don't regularly PJ anymore because I think it's pretty boring. However, I made a software with which you can make visuals live. I wouldn't call it a hacked software, however, I mean, if you're a hack, I mean, everything falls under the number of hacking these days because once you make something that you made yourself, you're automatically a hacker. It's like a weird word. But I like the image on Facebook, but anyway. Um, so after the party, after the officials, after the PJ, I went to a friend's house and I played a video game, which I hadn't done in many years. I played with that beat. This is David's friend of mine. I didn't know he was going to be here. I didn't know he was going to be at that party either. You never know with your friends. They never come until they come to lots. Um, and then, so, video game, yeah, joke right there. Um, but uh, I had to play it and I finished it the whole night. Four hours. And that was just sitting on the couch waiting for me to finish it. Come on, I asked you to play with me now, so just be a little bit more, you know, like a man, not a boy. <laughs> so, playing video game, I played video game, not him. So I thought, okay, because he's been waiting until 3 a.m. for me to finish this video game. He had no reason to be there until that day. He was just watching me play the video game. I thought he would play the video game today while I'm presenting. This is not a very nice video game to play because it's actually not a video game. But I don't tell it to David, he just has to suck it through. So, there's some rules here for you, I'll tell you, that he doesn't know. This, you don't want to touch this, because then you restart and score it. You can touch it, it doesn't break anything, it's just a different camera perspective, jumping, and you know, the usual walking stuff. Very, very, very simple. This is the uh, bank that's running, it's Monday, it's a PJ software. That game is not started yet. I'm <laughs> what should we do? Should I play it? Relax. <laughs> so, I have a close make one. I have, um, I'm, I'm living in Amsterdam, however, I'm a colleague of Ramon. Uh, we sit often in the same classroom. Mm. So, um, actually, I sit often next to Ramon. It was funny, I didn't know. You never know anything. Um, so, Usually I can also talk theoretically, however, I saw David and I thought we would make it about suffering tonight. We already had something about that. Uh, my PhD on Dean Goldsmiths is about resolutions. And resolutions, you know, when you're at work, every day you're at work because you're part of the nation that's always at work, um, you're fighting to win something, or you, win, you have something to gain there, and there's another party that also has something to gain. And when you start to have war, theoretically, then there is a resolution, but the resolution is really just a compromise, right? Because you want to win something, you give something away, and then you sign an act, and you give something away, and maybe compromise, and call that a resolution. However, you know, the resolution is just a nice word for making a compromise between different actors. In software, it's the same. When we talk about resolutions, we're talking about images, often, and we're talking about a flat width and height, or length and height, whatever. Um, that's what we come to think of as resolutions. However, that's not a resolution. I often, you know, do visuals. I did visuals, uh, for instance, in um, uh, where was it? In um, Moscow, in Russia, the, um, maybe last year. And it was nice because, you know, I play with a band called Knuckle. They make acoustic music. I do visuals. It's live. But I do it not like this digitally, but I play with an analog synthesizer and there's a whole lot of machines hanging around behind that. It was just before the game, um, the fighting with, um, they were, they had this new law where you cannot proclaim you're gay anymore, you cannot make gay propaganda or anything, so everybody was very afraid that we would do something against that. So uh, we were really thinking about actually making a statement that you don't want to get into trouble and also the music is not really about that kind of troublemaking, so it's just for simple people. However, they were afraid of us. We were invited by the um, Dutch embassy to play visuals in a big venue. And what they did, they built a tower between the visuals and the screen to control my visuals so they could cut out everything all the time. That was okay, so so. That was just another resolution that gave me some lagging. Another thing happened is that I came in and I asked, so where can I do the visuals? 
because I had to send a writer, you know, I had to explain what I'm doing, and they said, no, it's there. I said, yeah. it's not this wall, of course, but that wall is black. I had a photo of that in another PowerPoint I presented, but I don't think it's PowerPoint time, but it's a photo of a black wall. It was actually a screen, um, but that's a black screen. You know what happens when you project on a black screen? It doesn't um, reflect the light, it eats the light. And the guy just said, no, that's the best technology you could find. So it was this, I hadn't put on the writer that I wanted the white screen. So for that they bought, or they hired the best technology and it also had a black screen. And later I found out it was for black back projection. However, um, they didn't realize it and I didn't know it wasn't built, the venue wasn't built to do back projection, so they just had like, like kind of washed out visuals, nothing like this at all. So what happened basically was, and that was the moment that I re really realized how important resolutions are for doing visuals live, but in any kind of case, is that the resolution is not just, you know, this part of the image. That's the way we've been conditioned to think about resolution setting. The resolution is also the software, the hardware, the ways the videos in the software and the hardware are rendered, all these like backstories of why they're being rendered that way. And so I started to kind of deconstruct the word resolution, and I think it's something to really think about these days. Because when we see this now, what David is like suffering over, this, I mean, it's another way to show visuals, right? Because it's videos and it's like images in a 3D landscape, so we're no longer looking at the video as a four-cornered object, four-cornered object kind of projected on polygons. You reset it. I told you, don't do it. It's boring. <laughs> um, but it's possible, you can do, so you get to reset. Um, a resolution is in video is something we're conditioned to think as width and height. But what if our resolutions weren't just four corners? What if we made videos that had three corners or seven corners or eight corners? Why is that not possible? Why can I not make a quick time movie with those kinds of corners? So I just at that point I started to think, and it's not so long ago, that's also when I became the worst student next to Lamon because I had to change everything up in my PhD. Um, videos are what we have been conditioned to think about the video. It's something that goes over time, maybe has a soundtrack, it's just an amount of pixels and that's it, but it could be so many more things. I could make so many more, look, this is an interface that's way more than just that video. It's a bit simple. Um, that has more corners, that has more opportunities, and that I could make modules of and bounce around and see, like, make my own directions in. It's kind of the same as, you know, Minecraft. Minecraft uses just um, blocks, however, they have got a beautiful book that isn't, I don't know if anybody has seen the Minecraft book, but I fell in love with it, not because I like Minecraft, necessarily. I don't hate it either. The book is hexagonal. Imagine just if you had books or texts that were hexagonal, if you could start to modulate chapters. And I, I don't know if anybody still, if it's not prose, if they still read linearly. Do you read a PowerPoint or a PDF from A to Z? I, I don't, so I, mean, I go to the words that I like and then I find my information around those words, but I don't go and read the PowerPoint from, hey, I want to read the whole PowerPoint. I mean, that's, no, that's old-fashioned reading, I think. Or it's book reading, but it's not information reading, we don't do that. So why do we still present our information, even on the internet still, very much so, linearly? So that's when I started to rethink resolutions and started to try to explain to people that resolutions are very old-fashioned these days. When we talk about resolutions, very one or two-dimensional. There's nothing more, almost. How are you doing, Lavi? <laughs> um, yeah, there's some color in there. I found a secret color space, but you can't get out. Should I help you? No. Okay. <laughs> um, however, I, sh I would help you because now I have no slides. This is like, if you give your slides away, then you lose lots there. Yeah. This is a... Um, a video game, actually I built this video game with the help of, and this is very funny, uh, Ilza? Ilza is a part of Inpa, and they helped me to get to um, Mexico, where I 
had to live with the pet. Yeah, it was kind of like a prison. Um, I had to live with two girls. One was uh, from, um, if you're talking about resolutions, this was very funny. So I'll tell this little anecdote. Uh, one was from Croatia, and one was from Manchester. One was special, and the other one lived in horoscopes, which meant she was water and I was fire, so we couldn't talk. Then the situation really becomes a prison, so I thought I would just try to get out of prison, so I had prison break, and I went to Lita, which is a, it's a, um, like a surrealist architectural garden that I think if you ever had the chance to visit in Mexico, you should go to Lita, which is built by Sir Edward James in the 1940s, maybe in the 1940s, maybe a little later. Um, he used to be the, the patron, patronat, the, the one that pays the surrealist artists, so Dali and Neymar Fink, they were his, um, you know, his men. I mean, these men, they were all men together, they had dance parties together also. So he, this was the people that he used to dance with. And um, he wanted to be an artist, but he was too high up in class to become an artist, so he went to Mexico to become an artist, and this is where he spent millions of dollars, he also sold all his art, he built a serious garden, and I tried to rebuild this because I think this garden has staircases to nowhere, it has no real usage. If you walk through the garden, it's just very fantastic, but it has no you know, point of reference if you're going up or down and going somewhere or nowhere. So I thought I would build an environment to show videos that were not about to go somewhere, and then I could browse as a VJ, you know. Um, next to the DJ, it was cooler, um, and not be browsing or running to anywhere, and just show this. So I published this and I put it online, and it happened was really beautiful. You can't really see anything in the slides, so I'm just going on tangent. Um, I published it, I do everything, I always publish everything so people can use it also, and a guy from The Wire, Wired, Wired Magazine, um, most people that are hackers will know. I hear, I don't know, it's like a big magazine for computer culture. They reviewed it, and they reviewed it as boring because you can't win. They reviewed it as a video game. It wasn't supposed to be a video game, but because it was built within the platform of Unity, which is a video game engine, they immediately saw the resolution. It's 3D, in a video game platform, must be a video game. What I try to do is take out my video game, my videos out of this, you know, way of watching videos out of the four cornered screen and put them into something else. And the moment I reframed them, they became what they were framed inside. So I learned that you can never escape the resolution. Every time you reframe the resolution or uh, content, it becomes what is framed inside. It's so hard because I don't. You know, I'm known to make glitch work. I wouldn't necessarily frame this as a glitch work, but it doesn't really matter. I call myself a resolution artist now, but nobody really cares about what you call yourself anyway. Um, so, this became a work of non functioning video game. And it was, they said, it's in German, they said, um, it's annoying, something in German. That is very wonderful. Um, so my presentation was supposed to be about data being fluid. And I think this is something I do want to tell you. The difference between data and information, I know any hacker should know this. I feel like I'm burning up, but I don't know how you guys are feeling. Um, the difference between data and information is data can be any information, as long as you frame it. If you put an algorithm on top of it, it can become anything. I can put just a string of eight zeros and ones. If I put it through the right algorithm, it can, it can become Beethoven's symphony. I think most coders, hackers, people should know that. It's really that simple. You can make anything out of anything, as long as you frame it in the right way. And it comes to that. When it becomes information, it's something that the humans know how to interpret, right? So this is something that glitch artists have been playing with for a very, very long time. They try to sonify, for instance, rainbows. So when they have a photo of the rainbow, the gradient, they put it in a sound software and they can listen to the rainbow. Um, if you're um, making a beautiful PDF, you can actually um, also listen to it. Or you can like 
look at your images. If you know how to work with data. Um, what happens is that a lot of glitch artists still do the same experiments, so a lot of these kind of controlled outcomes, they've become kind of familiarized. And now, I mean, glitch used to be kind of cool. We used to look at glitches and think, whoa, what's going on? And we used to be kind of scared of glitches also. These days when I see, for instance, analog noise, I know that it's about a ghost. A ghost is going to come through my screen, right? If I look at blocks that are broken in my screen, I know that the aliens are talking to me. No? If it's lines, it must be artificial intelligence. It's like very hard to think. I mean, if the screen is green and black and it shows some weird code through the language, then it must be the hackers that are trying to communicate. There's a lot of noise artifacts that now have become standardized into meaning something else. And so what happens with all these like, experiments that keep happening and happening and happening is that they become a language on their own. And then we still lose this kind of fluidity of data that I think is very important if you want to set your own resolutions and if you want to build your own ways of showing how to play with content. How are you doing that? <laughs> Let's see if it's stuck in the middle of the room. So, a large post from Berlin. We have all the cool, even cool musicians, they make work about cryptography, but it's really annoying because it's always about fluidity of data and they don't really do anything new when it comes to politics. So I thought I would make my more sophisticated joke on them, um, which I was going to present, but now you can see it in a ball right here. Yeah, that's it. Um, it's not very real, is it? Um, it's a cat. So, I'm wondering if I should present this or if it was the time. Oh, yeah, that was good. And how are you feeling? Because I, I just feel like what a virgin. Not to be very safe. I think you got five minutes. Okay, well. Crash course to JPEGs. JPEGs are the most used file formats in the world, right? Everybody uses JPEGs. Use GIFs because they're cool, use BMPs because you're not so data smart. However, um, JPEGs are the compressions that we use all the time, that you download from the internet most of the time. It's a, an algorithm that comes, I mean, now I want you to know about this, it's a very also racist algorithm because it um, cuts out. Um, yeah, like the contrast areas, they're all very simplified, and especially when it's low contrast areas, it just completely ignores the little differentiation, so it can cut out all that information. So, for instance, for people of color, you can't see their faces very well because in a photo there's very little contrast in the face, so it will make it all like a very blurry, one colored mess. So JPEG is one of those standards that are very difficult when it comes to, well, I mean, they're built from a paradigm that you think efficiency is the key. You need to use as little data to get as much visual information as possible. That's how they make JPEGs, with this in mind. Um, and they organize the data via macro blocks. Um, if you go a little bit to the left, yeah, there. Those black and white things, they are macro blocks. So all the Say, and I'm making a wild guess, 90% of the images you see these days on the, in, on the internet are made just from these little blocks. Those blocks are called macro blocks. They're part of DCT, which is a discrete cosine transform. A discrete cosine transform has um, 8 by 8, by 8? has six, 64 macro blocks. So all your images, or most of all the images you see these days, especially on Facebook, are compressed via 64 different kinds of organizations of data, which is very scary. Imagine that every image that you see actually just consists of 64 different called letters of the image, like an alphabet consisting of 64 letters, visual letters. Here, here they're floating right there. Um, so I was going, I made a kind of an alphabet out of this, so you can put your own kind of data inside of your JPEGs and be a little bit cooler than the usual cryptography artist that just listens to rainbows. Um, then there's all these beautiful slides that David is showing you right now. Here's the alphabet that uses um, 
binary code to translate into um, macro codes. Yes. These are the blocks. Um, you have to imagine that um, when you have an alphabet, every letter has an ASCII value. ASCII is like a, uh, an encoding number, uh, encoding glyph. A glyph is the form of the letter. And every form of letter has a Unicode value. And then I assign every Unicode value to one of those 64 macro blocks that the JPEG compression is built out of. So in this sense, we can make our JPEGs, but we can actually kind of just write data from it. And I made a, I, I had a show in um, New York, here. And then I made my institutions, my resolution, findings. I wrote them as broken JPEGs. Um, this is important because, one, we can use parts of our interface in different ways, and we've been taught we can't. We can play with data, we cannot put data inside of other applications most of the time. For instance, I know it's so hard, it's so hard to follow me also, it's so abstract, and you feel you're suffering also. Um, no, but generally, I cannot play the video game and put video inside of my video game. Every software says stop, I only accept these resolutions. I will not take your photos, I only do this kind of videos. I will not take your videos, I will only do this sound. So, I wanted to show that there is more kind of fluidity between data, and that we, can, we call it siphoning, that you can siphon. There's a guy from New York that built siphon also. It's like a very awkward tool that you can implement in your software so that you can push data and push information from one app to another. And that you can actually put different kinds of flows of data or of information into other applications and work with them live. So that's what data is doing now. That's what you've been suffering for, as you see. Uh, I made institutions of resolution disputes just to show this and to build new forms of that. And you can be part of the resolutions, uh, the institutions. The inst Actually, I was fired from the institute the other day, so I started my own institute. It's a real story. But I thought I would follow an institution that has no you know, functionality, except for functioning in more ways than is normal. And you can become, and you can always ask the institutions if they can be on your CV. So you know, I think I should stop here because I can talk all kinds of abstract. But, you know, thank you for keeping <laughs>